Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the campus of Central Washington University here in Ellensburg, Washington, USA. It's a freezing fog kind of a morning here in the Kittitas Valley, and the local time is 8.50, 8.50 a.m., and we will begin our program called Westward Subduction at the top of the hour, at 9 o'clock local time. So it's about 10 minutes from now. Uh, but I'm live with, oh my God, we've got 350 people already. We had three, 350 people waiting. And I know why. This is a special morning uh, for a number of reasons. So I'm glad that you're with us. Thank you for joining us. Let's say hi to a few folks and make sure that we are doing okay with the technology. I see Frank says it's five by five. Thank you, Frank, from Lidwood, Washington. James is in Sela, Washington. Okay, I'm going to uh, slow the chat down here now. Uh, Hollyoke, Massachusetts. Scottsdale, Arizona. White Salmon, Washington. Rockland, California. Hello, Las Vegas, Nevada. San Diego, California. Los Gatos, California. Gatineau, Quebec. Hello, Michelle. Milwaukee, Oregon, suburb of Portland. Thank you, Steve, for that gift. Uh, Martinez, California. Reston, Virginia. Apex, North Carolina. <coughs> Red Deer, Alberta. Uh, Kalispell, Montana. Oh, I just skipped down to live for some reason. Neon, Switzerland. Bonaire, Dutch Antilles. Hello, Andre. Uh, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Marion, uh, Marinette, Wisconsin. Prince Edward Island, good Lord, I keep scrolling down to live, why? I'm, I'm scrolling back again, baby. <clears throat> Ottawa, Canada, East Tennessee, Vancouver, Washington, Northamptonshire in the old UK. That's Nicky, Knocky, Nacky, New. Can't make this stuff up, folks. Longview, Washington, Kamloops, BC, Shiedam, the Netherlands, hello, Ben. Antioch, California. I'm back a ways. Yeah, foggy. Uh, Pam says it's foggy in the Bitterroot Valley of Montana. Man, it's dense fog here for sure. Silver City, New Mexico. Denio, Nevada. I think that's how you pronounce that. Hi. Ontario, Canada. Hi, Indiana, Tysic. What? Therese from the Netherlands. Gweems Island. That's in the San Juan Islands of Washington State. All sorts of folks from all over the place. Wonderful. Let me uh, invite the guest before I forget, and then we will talk more. So give me a second, if you would, please. Invite the guest, boy. While I'm at it, let me make sure the sound is off on this monitor. Good. Okay. Ba oh, Patrick's with us. Hey, Patrick, age eight. Nice to see you today. Let me let me scroll back and do a few more hellos, and then we can. Uh, yeah, let's just say a few more hellos. Tucson, Arizona. Peshastin, Washington. Atascadero, California. Claudia, I, 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 have trouble, I have trouble with your town. Early on a Saturday morning. Corbett, Oregon, that's outside of Portland. Squim, Washington. Kansas City, Missouri. Soldotna, Alaska. Uh, Idaho Falls, Idaho. Hello from Illinois, says Harold. Yep, there you are, Patrick. Hello, I love you too. It's nice to have you with us again. Boy, we go back, way back, you and I, Patrick. And this morning's a big morning. I see our guest has arrived in the live chat. So uh, she's, uh, or I mean, in the green room. So that's wonderful. That's functional. Nice. A few more hellos, and then, yeah, we can talk about this volcano and this tsunami alert. Uh, I don't know much. I just happened to glance at Twitter uh, 20 minutes ago and saw something, and I, I, I think you know more than I do. Uh, 
Gail's in plain Washington. Tacoma, Washington, baby, says the sparky lady. The Geekus is in Alabama. Lots of North Americans here today. Do we have more distant folks? There we go. Uh, Tolga, Norway. Hamlin, Germany. West Sussex, UK. Arlhus, Denmark. Edmonton, Alberta. Scrolling back. I'm, I'm having too much fun. We've got a few minutes yet, don't we? Just, I, it's just fun to say hi to and, and see all these distant locations, and there's a particular reason we're doing this. Actually, you know what? No, I do want to do this. Uh, let me go down to live. We'll do three more. Cop Bo's in Copenhagen, Denmark. Garrett, the Dutch night owl, is in the Netherlands. Norley's in Colombia now. Itchyboots.com. Check it out. Amazing, amazing channel. Kirk's in Sweden. Mirage is in Laufenburg, Germany. Zazu is in Belgium. Aaron Donaghy. Hi, Aaron. Aaron Donaghy from Purdue University in Indiana. Bill is in Canal, uh, B.C. Stefano is in Italy. Tutta. Tui. Ta. Uh, Taitite from Dorman, Germany. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so before we start, so we're going to start in four minutes. Thank you for being with for being with us, I now see we have almost 600 people continue to roll in. Um, let's do four minutes on this volcano. What do we know? Is it the Tonga volcanic uh, system? There was an eruption. I honestly haven't seen anything except somebody talking about some amazing satellite images. And uh, there is a tsunami alert for the west coast of North America. Is that true? And is, that wouldn't be this morning, would it? Would that be tomorrow morning? I mean, it's a big ocean. Jerome's with us. Nice. So I'm just going to hang on for a couple minutes and, and learn from you. And we'll piece together what we know. Uh, the satellite videos are incredible, says Shane. We had a tsunami warning. Okay, so the Tonga volcano in Indonesia... Um, I don't know, we'll see if our guest knows much uh, at this point, and maybe she can fold this into what we're talking about at some point, but it won't be a major focus. And I guess what I'm asking, hang on, current tsunami warnings, Alaska to Mexico and Hawaii, uh, when are those waves expected to arrive, or have they already? That'd be, would that be tomorrow? Or when did this thing happen? When did the eruption happen? Has that, the eruption happened yesterday or something? Now we got time. 8.30 in Oregon. This morning or tomorrow morning? Oscar says it's happening now in San Diego. How, how, two foot waves, says Stoneyard, hitting Santa Cruz now. It's already past Hawaii. Okay, so it is now arriving on the west coast of North America. Um, do we have real information? How, Jerome in, in, on ben, in Vancouver Island says uh, 16 to 18 hours after. So we're already, we're already 16 to 18 after. Where, God, where have I been? Sleeping, apparently. One to two foot waves. Four foot in Oregon. Okay. So anyway, I, I think my plea, we're about to start. Uh, it's exciting. And I will, I will enjoy learning about all that we know about that event. Um, I guess my, I'm asking you if, if it's possible to focus on what we're doing here today. <laughs> and when we start you know, doing live questions with our guest, um, I don't know. Can you kind of police yourself in the live chat and just kind of say, hey, you know, we've already talked about it a little bit. and We're just not going to bring it up now. Uh, you know, from past experiences, I know that... Uh, if there's something kind of current-ish, people want to just stop what you're talking about and talk about this thing happening right now. Well, I'm kind of dealing with it right now the best I can, but I'm basically saying I got nothing to say because I've been, I've been preparing for our, our show today. And I'm, I'm just wondering if we can just have that portion of our discussion um, fade away at the moment. I don't know. Maybe it's ridiculous to even request that, but... This is going to be a good show, I think. Unless I screw it up, it's going to be a good show. So I need to focus on this. 
Speaking of which, I got one minute. Would you give me one minute to collect my thoughts? I'm going to check one more time. We doing okay with the uh, audio and the visual? The guest is in the green room. Oh, the iPad. I need to connect the iPad. Hang on. Five by five. Thank you. This new laptop I just got notified is, is still not going to arrive for another three or four weeks. So I, I've got to play this game with this laptop I have with only two ports. But by now I, I'm, I'm comfortable uh, using the iPad early and then, and then unplugging it. Okay, Roger says the audio is perfect. Thank you. And Backcountry Gary, thanks. Okay, good. Okay, give me one minute and we'll begin. Thank you for joining us. I mean it. Thank you for joining us, 684 people and growing. Excellent. We'll start in less than a minute. Hot mic. Okay. Are you up to the challenge today, boy? Boy, I say boy, are you up to the challenge? You're going to start with that gift. You're going to go to the iPad early. You're setting up Karin by doing that, North Cascades, Basil, Daryl, and you're not going to be long-winded now. You've got to get to this guest. Okay. We can do it. I believe in you. You can do it. Good morning to everybody around the world. Thank you for being with us this morning. I mean it. It's a special thrill to always have you with us. What? Special thrill? It's a thrill every time that we put these together and you all show up. But this morning is extra special for me, and I don't want to embarrass the guest, and I, don't, I guess I don't want to embarrass myself. But to have a live guest from the south of France who's in the green room right now ready to join us and watching with you uh, is a special thrill. And uh, a couple of papers I have waiting for you at the website that we'll look at in a second. And we'll just kind of have the show speak for itself. But uh, it's an important moment for this series, and I hope that you enjoy it. We're going to start with uh, a reminder that this is a series of shows focusing on the Eocene. That crazy Eocene, and the whole goal is to uh, take a, a, a round trip, a trip around the world, meaning all sorts of concepts related to the Eocene period, the Eocene epoch within the uh, Cenozoic period, talking about the North Cascades. And I'm all motivated by this group of geologists here, Bob Miller, uh, Mike Eddy, and Stacia Gordon, who are continuing their work in the North Cascades, and I am their public outreach person. And so I'm learning what I can about the North Cascades. And as I've discussed this winter, this series is being big and wide. And in, in the case of uh, today, again, going deep uh, to, to learn some big things, some grand things, and then go to the North Cascades and uh, zero in on some details, which we will be doing next show, by the way. Our next show will be Wednesday afternoon at 2 p.m. with, uh, with uh, Jeff Tepper, uh, return guest, Jeff Tepper, and we will be in Washington. We will looking at Eocene magmas. But uh, today is big and wide and deep, and uh, I, I could not be more thrilled um, by our guest. I'm a little off because I'm just trying to like, oh, uh, settle down, settle down. Okay, I'll settle down by doing this. In other words, I'm going to speak for about 30 minutes or less uh, before we go to our guest. Uh, the role for me is to keep some of these narratives going that we have established this winter and ask a few questions out loud. I actually had a big moment about 45 minutes ago writing things on the chalkboard. I'll explain in a second. But I want to start with a thank you to Craig. Craig from the Midwest. And over the holidays, Craig, uh, Craig sent this to the house and he said, I think you might enjoy this issue of Fortune magazine. 
from February of 1969. Look at the articles in this thing. What business wants from Nixon? I mean, come on. <laughs> so this is not a science magazine from late 1960 or so for the, the late 1960s, but 50 years ago, Craig sent me this because he says, I think you might enjoy this article. I can read it backwards right now. A new theory about the Earth is providing answers to some old questions. Are continents moving? What causes earthquakes and volcanoes? Oil and mineral prospectors are already getting practical hints from the secrets of the spreading ocean floors. This is roughly 50 years ago, and there are maps starting to appear like this. 50 years ago, and one of, one of our boys was looking at this with me uh, over the holidays at the kitchen table, and he's like, uh, God, that was only 50 years ago? Like, weren't you alive at that time? It's like, yeah, I was like seven years old, 1969. So I think the first thing I want to say is, 50 years from now, 2072, as the geologists and the geology instructors look back on us here in the early part of the 21st century, who are they going to be talking about? I think they're going to be forgetting about most of us. Most of us aren't going to be around in 2072, but I think there's a good chance they're going to be talking about our guest and her work 50 years from now, Karin Siglog. So I don't want to hit it too hard, but I mean... 50 years ago, that was the discussion. And Tanya Atwater was basically saying this. This is 50 years ago. Hey, we know now that there's basalt on the ocean floors of the world, and the basalt is not all the same age. And then if you look at the Atlantic Ocean floor, there's this beautiful symmetrical pattern and these colors, and these colors are ages of the basalt on the Atlantic Ocean floor. And the reds are relatively young basalt lava. And as we get to the greens and the blues, the lava gets older and older and older. In other words, it's not all the same age, and there is something going on in the Atlantic Ocean floor. That wasn't just Tanya, of course. That was the, la the previous 30 years' worth of work post-World War II. But we have this pattern in the Atlantic Ocean floor. And because of those isochrons on the Atlantic Ocean floor, we know the position of the North American continent over the last 200 million years. That's a known, based on the pattern of these isochrons in the Atlantic Ocean floor. Tanya Atwater, 50 years ago, says, we've got the same kind of butterfly wings, the same kind of symmetrical, beautiful colors on opposite sides of a spreading ridge known as the East Pacific Rise in the Pacific Ocean. And the color bands are wider because the spreading was faster. But Tanya's, one of Tanya's main points 50 years ago is we've lost one of the wings. Up here in the Northern Hemisphere, in the Pacific, if we can get North America back to where it was earlier in the opening of the Atlantic Ocean, wouldn't we have the same greens and blues on the opposite side? And most of us can say yes. There's a bunch of Pacific Ocean floor material that was offshore of North America that isn't there anymore. Like the butterfly lost its wing. It's a sad story. But our guest has found the missing butterfly wing. And the butterfly wing that has left us was not destroyed. It's down in the lower mantle. So I hope you saw our last show with Spencer Houston from Houston. And he was primarily in the upper mantle finding the Yukon slab, which if brought back to the surface is known as the resurrection plate. Well, our guest today is... Uh, making discoveries and has made discoveries in the last 15 years with her techniques, her tomography techniques, to find these things called slab walls. And they are vertical. Now, Spencer didn't have a vertical slab. We got a vertical slab today. And it's a vertical slab that does not have a continuation to the surface. 
So it's a severed vertical slab that is sinking 10 millimeters per year through the lower mantle. And it has been constantly sinking 10 millimeters, plus or minus 2 millimeters per year uh, since the Mesozoic. It's these slab walls that we're talking about today. Yes, I came up with an analogy of ribbon candy. There's many different ways to come up with an analogy for what these slab walls look like. But the thickness of these slab walls is far thicker than the thickness of the ocean crust when it was up in the butterfly wing on the surface of the Pacific Ocean floor. So Karan's models talk about this uh, ocean floor crust, the thickness of the white uh, folding on itself and creating this slab wall or slab curtain five times thick as it should be. Vertical sinking slabs. Okay, well, how am I going to tie this to the North Cascades, for goodness sake? And what's that moment that I had about 45 minutes ago? I guess an hour ago by now. Well, I remind you that there are three generations of plutons in the North Cascades, north of my town in the North Cascades. Again, that's the focal point for me. And I think we can take these three generations of magmas and tie them to this story of Karin and the lower mantles. Like, how are you going to do that? Well, this is an Eocene series, but we're not talking about the Eocene today. I'm sorry. Full disclosure, I got an email from Karin before the holidays, and she said, I see what you're doing there, and I'm just blown away by the uh, engagement of your audience, and I'd like to be part of this. And I'm like, really? Okay, well, let's find a date. And we came up with this date. So the previous three shows were designed to lead up to this show this morning. Okay. So we're not doing Eocene. We're not doing the tweener stuff either. We'll save that for later this month and into next month. Um, but this Cretaceous story, I blame Basil, this, this Cretaceous story tied to the hit of Rangelia, Rangelia Plus, Rangelia and Friends, otherwise known as the insular superterrain. I think everybody agrees that thing hit North America 100 million years ago. Or did North America hit the insular superterrain? Pause for dramatic effect. So the way I laid this out, now that we realize we're talking about this oldest part of the story, the oldest of the three generations of magmatic flare-ups in the North Cascades, our story today is, is, is it even a touch older than this? It's even a touch older than the plutons that we have here. And that's how I had my moment here an hour ago on the chalkboards as I was kind of laying this all out. So this is review, but it led to kind of a couple of thoughts. The review is, this is what we've done before, before the holidays. We had Rangelia Plus, Rangelia and Friends, the insular superterrains. I'm going to keep repeating that because that's, we're tying Rangelia with today's insular superterrain, which is the focal point of our discussion with Karin today. Rangelian friends is, is, is colliding with North America a hundred million years ago. And you know kind of what I've been thinking out loud to this point. Remember our fireworks analogy where you have a thump audibly and then there's a delay and then there's all sorts of mayhem happening. In other words, the fireworks are filling the sky. Well, that episode with Bob Miller, we had Cretaceous fireworks, where I was thinking that we had the 100 million year old hit, and then between 96 and 87 million years ago, our oldest plutons in the North Cascades, we have plutons invading from below, and we have thrust faults happening at the same time. Okay, as I was drawing this an hour ago, I had a couple of voices in my head. Uh, that's where I am now, okay? I'm kind of losing my mind. A little voice is ringing in my, in my ears. Daryl Cowan and Basil Tikoff from previous live stream episodes this winter. And as I'm writing this Rangelia, I have Daryl talking into my ear, not literally, but figuratively. If the Chugach terrain is an accretionary wedge, where is the volcanic arc? Remember this two shows ago? And he says, I think it's Rangelia. 
I think the volcanic arc is Rangelia for the Chugash accretionary wedge. And then he started talking about the coast plutonic complex or the coast belt in British Columbia with a bunch of plutons that are older than 100 million years old. And he kept saying Rangelia and coast belt interchangeably. And I, do you remember? I stopped him. I said, I'm confused, Daryl. Are you saying that the coast plutonic complex is Rangelia? He says, yeah. And then I started thinking with him. He helped me. He said, well, if you undo the translation on the border range's fault, and you get Chugash down into your neighborhood, Nick, now I'm paraphrasing, and if you undo the offset on the Straight Creek Fault in northern Washington and southern B.C., that gets the CPC, which now we're talking about as being Rangelia, even closer to your backyard. I'm pointing to frickin' Mount Stewart right now through the wall. That's Rangelia? Here's my moment. I thought all these plutons were happening inboard of slamming Rangelia onto the end of North America, or North America running into a fixed insular. But... I'm processing this as I'm talking to you, but I think I'm, I'm, I'm seeing maybe something. It feels like progress. Are these Cretaceous plutons in the North Cascades coming up through Rangelia? If the North Cascades are Rangelia and friends, the insular in other words, are the North Cascades originally out in the middle of the Pacific with a fixed trench and Karin's slab wall underneath. I'm ahead of my story, but I'm, I'm skipping ahead. Boy! And if that's these Plutons, which are 96 to 87, within Rangeli, within the North Cascades, what's this stuff then? Are these the Rockies? Now we're into the Rocky discussion with Basil. Basil quickly, again, the day before Thanksgiving when he first appeared, there was a moment where he just said, that's the hit he. His hit and run model. He said, that's the hit he. Rangeli is the hit he, the thing that hit. And it went so fast, I didn't even really comprehend it, but I think I'm starting to get it now. And again, the, the thing I didn't have before is the North Cascades in north central Washington. Uh, this, I may be going in a direction that I'm going to back away from, but at the moment, I'm starting to see... <laughs> North Cascades National Park is taking a drive over Washington State Route 20. We're driving through the insular superterrain, which again is the focal point of our discussion with Karin today. Wow! So to expand on that, and the last part of setting up our discussion with Karin, doesn't seem like I'm setting up Karin, but I, I think I am in my own weird way. <coughs> So this is 45 minutes ago, using the sexy chalk, by the way. Whew, I got I to calm down. Now, there's a chance I'm going to lay this out the way I have it in my head right now, and we're going to get our, our guest coming in, and she'll go, I'm sorry, you, you, you got it all wrong. Come on, now. What, are you, what are you doing? There's that chance. That's okay. That's okay. I'm willing to look like a fool. But I may be on to something through all of this help I've been getting from our guests and emails and texts and everything else. So to lay out the specifics. Karin has the slab wall in the lower mantle. And I'll, I'll let her explain a little bit more of the detail there. But Karin says, because we know the western margin of North America because of that Atlantic Ocean opening, this is one of her slides from a recent talk at Stanford University that she gave virtually, I think. She said, if we have this drifting continent, then and, and if you want eastward subduction... So here we go. We're getting into the crux of the matter. If you want eastward subduction, you remember the California triad with Daryl. I was doing that with Daryl primarily because it was interesting, but also I knew we were coming to Karin today. So I'm reminding you of the California triad. 
The one, two, three. Eastward subduction, meaning that this ocean floor is subducting to the east, underneath California, and we have an accretionary wedge, otherwise known as the sedimentary melange, that's the Franciscan, the four arc basin, and then the volcanic arc. These magmas generated from a subducting oceanic plate. So, Karin says, if you want this drifting North American plate, and you have a trench offshore, and you have eastward subduction, you're generating magmas, and you, there's your one, two, three, your California triad. We're good. And this is the accretionary wedge, the Franciscan, and here's the volcanic arc inland. Okay, that is the kind of mainstream view of such matters. But Karin says, we should expect, therefore, to see a gradually sloping, continuous ribbon candy. in the upper mantle and then eventually the lower mantle. That's what we should see if this is the main story of what's going on. But over the last 15 years, Karin has said, I don't see that. Instead, I see this vertical slab wall that is not connected to the surface and Karin says, I've been working closely with Mitch Mahalanek, and she has, British Columbia uh, Geological Survey. And Mitch could not be with us today, but hoping to get him on at some point. Karin and Mitch say, look, this is, this is our model, that we have westward subduction of an ocean basin before 100 million years ago. So you see, suddenly we're, we are older than 100 million years ago. We're older than the oldest plutons in the North Cascades. Play along with me, though. Why? Because if I continue to like this idea of Rangelia and Friends being the insular superterrain and the North Cascades being part of that story, then all of our am amazing scenery in the North Cascades is out here in the middle of the frickin' Pacific Ocean with a fixed trench and westward subduction feeding this fixed trench. And you're like, well, how do you know it's fixed? And Karin says, once you establish this westward subduction underneath this insular superterrain, which is a volcanic arc, Remember, this is the thing that has a long, complicated history. It's, it's down over some hot spot, probably at the equator at one point. It's got pieces of northern Europe within it. I mean, it's a complicated story. Yeah, this is the Rangelia stuff that Jerome was talking about in Nanaimo, British Columbia, and parts of it up in Alaska. But Karin's main point, Karin and Mitch, are saying that once you establish this sinking of this vertical slab wall underneath a fixed Rangelia and Friends, it's not going to drift. This is like an anchor for this insular boat. And so if we're going to collide insular and North America 100 million years ago, and apparently we are, according to everybody, everybody agrees we're going we're to suture these two guys together, Insular's playing hard to get. Insular says, yeah, we can collide, but I'm not coming to you. You've got to come to me. I'm, I'm anchored out here with a westward subducting ocean plate. So the point is, how are you going to get rid of this ocean floor before 100 million years ago? We need to consume or somehow get rid of that ocean plate material. Some say, I know California geology very, very well. And you need eastward subduction, as I've been taught for years and years and years. You need eastward subduction to get rid of that ocean floor. But is it possible that we can also do westward subduction at the same time? Can we get rid of this ocean floor by doing both of these eastward and westward subductions at the same time and close this ocean basin? Does the timing of that work out? 
and I'll let Karen speak for herself, but I, I think there's I think there's a, 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 a reaction right now where they just lock on to the westward subduction part of Karin's and Mitch's story, and they just go, well, those guys are westward subduction. They don't, they, they, obviously, they can't, they, they're, they're discarding our, our wonderful California geology, or Idaho geology, according to Basil, or whatever. So the timing of this is fuzzy in my brain. When do we for sure have eastward subduction? When do we for sure have westward subduction? When might we have both? And when do we have neither? I guess we have neither right now, <laughs> San Andreas Fault. Two more things and we're going to our guest. Karin, I'm almost coming to you now. I think I have permission to share this. Uh, remember, we had Basil Tikoff twice. I really enjoy him. And Basil has a new paper coming out. And I don't have the context for this in his, well, actually, I do have the context. He sent me the whole paper, which has not been published yet. But I, I'm sorry, Basil, I haven't read the whole thing yet. But as I was making this kind of connection for myself, I, I'm seeing Basil entertaining some of these same ideas, and maybe many others as well. But my learning process with this, uh, that's where I am right now. And maybe I can make a couple leaps forward as I chat with our guest. I do have two more things, really quick. I know I just said that. And I don't want to hit this too hard, because I really enjoyed our visit from Spencer. This is the last show, and this is Spencer's view now. Where are the vertical slab walls? I don't, I don't really see them. And as a guy who's been teaching about Karin and Mitch in my Geology 101 class, I, I'd love to be able to eventually see the vertical slabs, the resurrection slab, the Idaho slab that Gene Humphreys was talking about. I'd like to see it all kind of in, in black and white or in living color. And I, I don't think we're there. The last teaser, and then I promise we're going to Karin. Karen gave a talk in Stanford, that's in California, I guess virtually, now that I think about it. And she had some slides, and this one caught my eye. There's no reason so far to reject the vertical slab sinking hypothesis and the implied archipelago. The idea meaning that North America is drifting and plowing into not only a fixed insular, but a bunch of other island arcs that were out there in the Pacific, an idea put forth by many people over the years, Eldridge Moores, I think even Bill Dickinson at one point. But I don't know what to do with this. Are people rejecting the vertical sinking hypothesis? And if they are, why are they? All right. So I think we uh, should enjoy this rare treat to visit with Karin Siglock. I didn't even go to the iPad. I'm sorry, Karin. I'm sorry, Karin. I want to go. I got the iPad in here. So, God dang. <laughs> what a tease. What a tease. I'm sorry. Uh, real quick before I unplug the iPad. So, here we are in session P. You're welcome to come back. Session Q. That's Jeff Tepper. Session R. We'll be looking at Idaho. More details coming on that. Get rid of that. Pick this up, boy. This doesn't have to be very long. Uh, NickZentner.com. If we go to the upper right, we click on the word Eocene. Here are the two papers. I could have put many more, but here are the two papers that are waiting for you to enjoy. The most recent major collaboration paper by Karen Siglock and her close collaborator, Mitch Mahalanek from British Columbia, called, it's not called Westward Subduction, but I'm, I'm, those are my titles, obviously. And then there is a, a rather interesting essay written by Paul Hoffman, a Canadian geologist who's reflecting on Tanya Atwater, Karin Siglock, Bob Hildebrand, and others. Uh, but here's the paper from Karin and Mitch, Mantle and Geological Evidence for a Late, Cretaceous, uh, Late Jurassic Cretaceous Suture Spanning North America. 
And be, between that little dog and pony show with the chalkboards and then our visit with Carr, and hopefully this will make sense, a little bit more sense to you. Finally, I am currently in Discovery Hall and Planetarium at CWU. Uh, let's go to France. Let's go to Geo Azure, which I really don't know anything about. Apparently, it's a laboratory in Valbon, France. That's French. <laughs> Let's get some context for where Karin is uh, north. Oh, man, she's, what is this, Monaco? The Cannes Film Festival? She's not in Oxford, England anymore, everybody. She's, she's near Nice, France, the south of France. All right. Hey, 9.30. Kind of what I promised. Power's back in. IPhones, uh, iPads disconnected. We're functional. Okay, I'm, thank you for your patience, Karin. Let's go for this. Let's try to bring you in here from the south of France. Hello, Karen. Hey, Nick. Hi. It's, it's, wow, what it's, an introduction. <laughs> you did all my work for me and all the publicity. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I mean it. I mean it. I try not to fawn over the guests, but this, this is a big deal. And the audio is sounding good, I think. We're, we're a, little, a little pixelated with the video, but maybe that will settle down here in just a second. So let's, let's just hope for the best. Um, yeah, it's uh, actually the same on my side. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. It, it should right. be a fast connection. but. I... Good. Oh, you're, you're improving. Yeah. Oh, you just... You just uh, yeah, we'll, 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 just, we'll just go for it. We've got 1,000 people watching. Wonderful. Hopefully they continue to pour in. They're all saying hi to you as well. Um, let me do a little back and forth with you first, and then we can just maybe uh, we'll improvise from, from that point on. How long have you been uh, working in France? Oh, I moved there half a year ago. So okay. uh, I moved from Oxford, where I spent eight years, um, and which is a wonderful place. Um, but there was something to do here in France, which is um, which is instrumenting the ocean. So as a, as a seismologist, you know, that's one that's maybe our biggest challenge, at least if you work on a global scale, that the oceans are not instrumented with um, seismometers. And that's what's being done here. And it's quite a unique place for that. You you notice that it was near Monaco and Cannes. So it's on the Mediterranean. And so we wow. can build and try out instruments. So are you starting that program or are you inheriting some sort of uh, ocean crust seismology project by somebody else? I am actually, uh, interestingly, I'm inheriting a program of my PhD advisor, which oh. started um, which started in Princeton in 2001 at the day I started my PhD, but he got his um, first postdoc, which was Frederick Simons, who's now a professor at Princeton. Hmm. to work on this really visionary idea of having drifting um drifting floats in the ocean to measure seismic waves and then so i wasn't i was not involved in that at that, that time i was working on what we're talking about today yeah um but um but then who's um Nolet, who's my phd advisor was my phd he he left me in princeton he moved to southern france so right here a year before i finished my phd at princeton and um you know, so I've been watching this from far for a long time, and he retired six years ago. And um, they had built prototypes, but but nobody was uh, really succeeding him here. And and I just I had been waiting until in Oxford or you know wherever until I could buy these instruments. Oh, wow. Certainly looked like that might not happen. So then I thought I, I have to do it myself. Oh, that's exciting. So are are you? So your work life is very different. You do not teach anymore, or you don't have students, or do you? Yeah, I, I don't have a teaching obligation at the moment. I mean, I, uh, I'm i sure I'll help out teaching, but for, for now it's a nice break. I was te teaching a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and do you have a, you must have a research team there, and what can we look forward to from your group over the next few years, maybe? 
Well, we're hoping to um, we're hoping to build new kinds of instruments that are more versatile, and that will really lead to um, you know to actually have a product that that colleagues all over the world can adopt and deploy the way they now deploy um, seismometers on land, and so that in an international effort that will scale to a to a fleet that covers the oceans. And, and that's what the, the physical oceanographers have accomplished in 20 years in a very um, impressive project that's called Argo. Mm -hmm. So they have 4,000 floats that measure the temperature and salinity every every 10 days, and then they send it home by satellite. And and that has an, had an immense impact on these IPCC reports because that has been the most reliable time series to show that the oceans are warming, mm -hmm. which is a much more even warming trend than, than the atmosphere. So it, you know, it was really important for climate change. Now for us, it's, it's going to be about, about earthquakes. I mean, it's super, right? I mean, today we have this underwater earthquake, um, a volcano that usually you never, I mean, you, 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 ha you ha rarely get to see it at all. I mean, here we have a huge ash cloud, which is, which is amazing. Usually these go almost unnoticed and we, we really don't know much about these volcanoes and because we, we have very little stations in the oceans. Oh just, yeah. Yeah. Just don't oh, interesting. Um, so is this, you know, we're, we're going to talk about North American stuff, uh, of course, but is the, is the North American or the American stuff kind of in your rearview mirror now? Or are, or are you still working on some of this kind of Pacific Ocean floor uh, slab material? Yeah, we, we're still thinking about this um, because it's the it's um, because it's the system we understand best now. And and, you know, the the, the American Cordilleras um, that really go from Siberia to Alaska, the North America, Central America, and the Andes in South America and, and West Antarctica. Um, that's one of the two big um, accretionary mountain systems in the, in the last 200 million years. And so because we've put a lot of effort in, into understanding North America, it's easier now to work, um, to work uh, North and South and also try to understand the other system that, that I'm sitting on now, which is the one that goes from the Mediterranean um, through the Middle East and then into um, into Sumatra, India, Sumatra. <laughs> Amazing. Um, well, one, one last kind of preliminary question. It's more of a personal thing. So, you're, you're, uh, what's your story? Like, did you did you uh, go to university to study physics, let's say, and then you stumbled into this geology thing late? Yeah, I studied I studied electrical engineering, which is you know which is applied physics basically, yeah. and um, and then I I happened to do my um, my PhD, uh, my my master's project, so that the final project after five years at Bell Labs in New Jersey, which which was the the research labs of the former telephone monopolist, so um, AT and T, which at that time wasn't a monopolist anymore, and, and that was an amazing place, and and. Uh, my advisors there said, you've done enough signal processing now. So I specialize in signal processing in electromagnetic waves. And, um, and, and they said, oh, you've done enough signal processing. And you, you have to find a field that you really like um, and to apply that to. And, and so I looked around and, and I decided that I, that I, I wanted to do geoscience. And um, you know, so, so my specialization, my core discipline is seismic tomography. Um, which is which is using earthquakes that are the signal sources. They're not electromagnetic sources. They are seismic sources. Um, to um, and they they sound the interior of the planet and and um, with that you can compute back what's inside. So that's the the equivalent of what medical people do with electromagnetic waves when they do a computed tomography of your brain or some other body part. And were you able to look? Uh enough down the road to see that you needed some geologist up here on the surface to kind of uh, connect your findings in the mantle with the surface? Or how did that uh, collaboration with Mitch Mahalanek come about? Yeah, that came gradually, really. I mean, first, my, um, my, my research started out as a method, um, a method study. We had a better method to do seismic tomography of the mantle. And um, and we needed a data set to try it. And that, that, at that time, the US array started rolling over the contiguous um, United States, um, starting in the West. So by the time I finished my PhD, it had covered the, the Western 
quarter or so. And it was clear this would be the best data set to try it on. And so then, then we, we did that. But then what we saw was, was so interesting and so different, really, from, from what, what I'd expected. So actually, the yeah. method, it didn't go on the back burner, but, it, but it, there was a strong competing interest of what, what does this mean? I mean, that was very different. And, um, but then it still, took, it still took a few years to... to um, I think it took a, it took talking to a Canadian geologist because that's where the ter accreted terrains are now. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. before that, during my PhD, I was talking mainly to the U.S. geologist where the terrains had accreted, but they are no longer there. And so <laughs> that that does change the perspective. And so I mean, you also need the kind of person who just wants to engage with that stuff. So wow. that turned out to be Mitch. Oh, that's uh, it's just it's just amazing stuff. And I. Um, uh, I, I, I want to follow your lead right now. You, you have some things that you might share with us, or do you want to just keep talking like this? It's kind of your call. Yes, yeah, as, as, as you prefer. I mean, if you want to talk about the Pacific Northwest, it, it really is a key. It turns out to have been a key, um, a key uh, piece, because I mean, the, 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 the strange thing that, that happened with U.S. Array was that so only the western part of the U.S. was at first really densely instrumented, although the U.S. as a whole was already decently instrumented. So there were stations, seismic stations everywhere, but, but suddenly there was this high resolution in the west. And what we could see is that the, so we could see the subducting crew on the Fuca plate under, the, under, under your area in the Washington, Oregon. And um, and people had seen that, um, but only followed it a few hundred kilometers deep. Yeah, yeah. And so suddenly we could see it very clearly, and and we could follow it, and it went all the way into the deep mantle, so to almost two thousand kilometers, which is two thirds down to the core of the Earth. And that was a surprise because um, there had been such deep slab had been seen. You've called them the slab walls. They are the big very steep and massive slabs that are under the eastern seaboard of the US. So way east, under the under the east coast. And they had been visible for 20 years. I mean, they're, they're such whopping big things that um, Stephen Grant's uh, result in the late 80s had shown them. And since then, they were just every tomography, every global tomography, it's very clear. So everybody had assumed that what goes in as the Fu and the Fuka plate at the surface somehow connects down you know, gradually under the U.S. and and joins these deep, massive things. And so suddenly we see that's not the case. Um, the the Juan de Fuca plate dips west much steeper. I mean, dips dips down much steeper yeah. and and has ends ends in very massive slab as well. But but it's just under Idaho or you know no no further east than Idaho. Yeah. And so that was. I mean, that is the Farallon plate because. We know, you know, it's the Farallon plate at the surface. So, and we followed all the way down. So it has to be the Farallon plate. And so then the question was, what is all that Eastern stuff that had always been the Farallon plate and was was just totally disconnected? And it's also just the same depth. So, because stuff sinks slowly in the mantle, so you you think if something is the same depth, it's the same age. So yeah, it's strange that those should be the Farallon plate. Well, if, if, yeah. if you're up for it, um, maybe we can take a look at a, a few images that, that correspond to what you were just talking about for those that are kind of new to this whole thing, if, if you can kind of easily find, you know, a portion of, yeah. of your talk to do that. So yeah. do you want to try to share, use the share button like we practiced yesterday? Yes. This is my first time visiting with, with Karin. We, we did a little bit yesterday, and uh, I was kind of afraid of you, Karin. Man, I, was, I wasn't sure what I was going to <laughs> but you were so personable yesterday. I was like, okay, I, I feel I'm kind of relaxed now. This is this is good. You you can actually um, communicate this stuff well. Okay, I see you now. Let me bring this in. Good. Yes, and we don't see your full screen. I you know, I decided to leave it like that. Good. I I tried make away almost everything, but else I, it's hard for me to navigate. That sounds good. That sounds good. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, so, so you know that that's what subducted lithosphere looks like when when we image it. There's there's a conventional way of rendering it, and you saw that yesterday, uh, not yesterday, but a few days ago in Spencer's talk. So yeah. it's a map view, and and it's cutting 600 kilometers at depth, 
and and then you see some blue blobs which which is the way we code fast um, that means the seismic waves run fast in in that area and at those depths that must be subducted lithosphere okay there's also some areas that are slow for example here under yellowstone so that's the opposite um, that should be stuff that's up welling up in the mantle um, but so we just ignore that in the in what comes. We're not interested in the upwelling and just in the downwelling. And so if you don't show that as just one depth, which is at 600 kilometers, but you want to see all depths, so 600 and everything that's below, then one way to show it is this way. And I'm going to use that over and over. That's why I'm taking some time to explain this rendering. Good. So um, so you can see that, for example, this what used to be this blue thing here is now a lightish blue color and it's contoured and and there's another one and then under it is something green and that shows the, the the subducted slab a little bit deeper and under it is something yellow that shows it even deeper so what we're seeing here is the complete subducted slab scape under your area from 600 kilometers in the mantle down to um you know 1600 or so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and, th and this is this Farallon plate. I'll just go to the next um, this next slide that shows the whole thing. Um, no, no, I have to I have to not click on your screen. I have to click on mine. Okay, here. <laughs> oh, great, yes. great, good. Yeah, yeah. So now we're looking from the south. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I don't think we can see your cursor. But that's no that's no big deal. Just letting you know. I don't think oh, we can see your little okay, pointer. Let me, uh, yeah. There we go. There we go. Can yep. you see it? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I just, I just, uh, I just shouldn't click on your screen with you on it, but on my screen with the, <laughs> the PowerPoint. Okay. Yeah. So, so here is this. So that that was the new slab, that had only been seen to some, a few hundred kilometers depth. So here the color changes every two hundred kilometers. So the the purple is the first, the shallow is two hundred, and then the dark blue is two hundred to four hundred. The color bar here shows that. And so it had been seen, so you see here, that's the coast, um, that's the Cordillera. And um, and, and so this purplish stuff is the lithosphere coming in. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it's relatively flimsy, like seafloor is at the surface. And then it dives down and it, it becomes very massive. It somehow bunches up. You can clearly see that as the further you go down, the more massive it is somehow. Mm -hmm. Sure, it doesn't look like uh, you know a tablecloth or a single sheet dipping in. It's it's much more than that. You've you've nicely explained that with your cotton candy. And you can also see it bottoms out uh, somewhere, maybe where the Great Plains begin, but not much further east. Huh. And. So that clearly is the Farallon plate because it's the Farallon plate up here. So it cannot be anything else, or at least it must be the direct. If it's not the Farallon plate, it's its direct uh, predecessor. Good. Um, and it's, and it's a lot of material. So because it is so massive, so that means um, it m must have taken a long time to subduct this because sea floor only comes in at a certain rate, and Tanya Atwater reconstructed what that rate was. And so if we have so much um, lithosphere in this place, it means it basically accounts for all of these isochrons that she saw, she reconstructed in the Pacific. So that was an, another problem of, we've used up all the Farallon plate that's known, because we know from these oh, isochrons, the yeah. Pacific how the Farallon plate is there, yeah. used to be there. And so we've already used it up in this slab. So, so, but there's even bigger slabs in the East. And what's that then? It's a problem. So I'll show you those eastern ones now, and then we've really, you know, seen the whole inventory under under North America. So what we were just looking at is is this. Um, you know, it's it's this, and I'm only showing everything that's deeper than 800 kilometers, which is the the lower mantle of the Earth. That's a very gooey, very viscous part. It's uh, compared to the shallower um, regions. Um, so if I had built that all full to three, so I'm showing only I'm showing only the green greenish reddish part. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you can see then if you go further east, there's a big disconnect, this white area, yep. and then there's this very um, linear and very long and um, slab, 
where everything is piled on top of each other, all the colors are on top of each other, and, and those are these walls. So there's very linear belts under the eastern seaboard essentially and under trending across Canada and also going across um, south of Florida and into the Caribbean where all the slab is and then in other, all the other places there's none and especially also into the Atlantic there's there's none so it's it's a very structured it's a very structured thing and it's it's it was strange in light of what we thought we knew sure so let me just go on so here i'm adding here i'm adding the upper mantle so so far we had seen only the that was the lower mantle and here i'm adding the upper mantle uh -huh. the slab so what changes here is that suddenly these gaps get filled in so whereas before we had a very yeah every 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 slab just seemed to stay in its own linear belt and and not um you know yeah it, it was the end it was just building building from low to high sudden you know in more recent times and this is this is probably the last so that's the paleo gene so it's the last 60 million years it's sort of more the time you're talking about this this darker stuff so there we see a smearing all across the continent mm -hmm. very different from before mm -hmm. and and now we can do one more thing i'll flip it inside out so right now we're hovering in space and looking down into the mantle but if we imagine we sit in the core and look up towards space, then it looks like this. Okay, so it's a way of, of <laughs> wow. seeing, seeing this more clearly, how at the deepest depth, so now the deepest, what's deepest is closest to the viewer. Cool. So you can see how, um, how very linear this is and how very steep and localized and how all of these slabs, including the one under the, you know, the Farallon, Bonafide, they all start at the same depth. Uh -huh. So it's not, not that the ones that are further east are much deeper, which would be one prediction from this from this always eastward subduction, because North America um, came from this region. It came from the Atlantic, and North America has traversed all of these slabs over time. So it's in its migration since it broke away from Pangaea. It's it's gone all across this, and that we know confidently. You've nicely mm -hmm. explained that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, so I, think, I think we should keep it, rolling. You know, you, you've given this talk probably in different forms for 10 plus years. And, and I, I am interested in kind of the reaction that you've, or the kind of how the reaction has maybe changed over the last 10 years. But let's save that. Let's, let's continue for a few more minutes if, if, you, if you're willing. And then I want to remind the live viewers that, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes from now, we're coming to you viewers. We're, you're going to get a chance to ask your questions directly uh, to Karin. So, okay, Karin, let's continue. This is wonderful. Yeah, and so then, so then, you know, the question is, uh, wh what, how, how can you explain this? Because, as you you nicely show, you showed my slide of, and and I just referred to it that that North America, the West Coast, especially the leading edge, it started out at the at the rightmost border of this image. And it slowly, in the last 270 million years, it, it went all across to the position that it's now. So it's, it's now um, west of all these labs, but it used to be east. And so if you had subduction into that, uh, if, if, okay, I mean, if you come at this without any baggage or out any history and you ask <laughs> someone where were the trenches, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody, everybody, comes up with the answer and that's this okay <laughs> so that the trench that's how the trenches started that's the earliest trenches and then they stay like this for a long time yeah. all through this all through this red reddish colors and then as we get to the yellowish color something changes you can see how how those trenches and why i'm saying trenches well actually it's lithosphere yeah. but what i'm assuming here is that once the lithosphere, well, what, what I'm guessing is, I'm not assuming it, this is very important, um, I'm not assuming it, I'm making a hypothesis, which is a, a, a reasonable guess, is that when something, how, how could you build such, such a slab wall, all the stuff in the same place? It must be that the trenches were sitting there and the lithosphere sinks into these trenches and it basically just sinks down. 
it doesn't go left or right because how else can you build a slab while the trenches should not have been moving and the and the the plate the once it was in the mantle should also not have flowed apart it, it's just still all there um so this is not an assumption it, it's it's a guess and if 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 that's what we guess then the trenches are where i drew them and i will now you know wherever i draw them i will draw them according to this guess um which is you know that if, if i see slab in the mantle in a place it means at some point there was a trench over it why do i hear from some people and, that's in why do i hear from some people that it's an assumption like i i do hear a little bit of pushback on this and they say well it's just an yeah, assumption yeah unfortunately, unfortunately it's I, I i i don't know unfortunately it's very hard to get that message message through um because if, if it were an assumption it, it it, it would be a very strong assumption because the issue in geophysics, I mean, it's not just that geology, you know, has uncertainties about where trenches are. It's also that geophysics, we don't, we don't, the, 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 the viscous properties of the mantle, there are large uncertainties about them. If there weren't, it would be easy. We would just know if lithosphere, when lithosphere goes in, that's what it does. That's how it deforms. We would know if it sinks in place or whether it deforms or whether, whether it, but but we don't. So we have a double uncertainty. So we somehow have to make our way through that. And so what we're doing here is is to make a hypothesis, which is a which is an educated guess. And and we make a very simple, we the most simple possible, which is saying this: I I'm going to try the idea that this stuff is still in the absolute latitude and longitude where it entered the mantle. Yes. And is there anything? anything in the geologic record or anything I can find that, that says, no, that's too simple. You have to make a more complex guess. And so that's how science should proceed. You should proceed. And, and, and if, a, if a hypothesis is simple, it has very few um, tuning parameters, very few um, things that you can wiggle. And that means um, you can falsify it. So, so you can find evidence to, to say, no, 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 that's not how it works. And that's how science, and then we have to make a more, you know, a more complex hypothesis. Unfortunately, it's been it, it's been so simple. Um, it's it's a hypothesis that people thought had already been rejected, and the reason is, um, and and North America had a lot to do with it. it. It's the reason that that there was this disconnect between some slabs were missing and and you know people thinking where the trench was. And so people had already sort of concluded that there must have been something very complex going mm -hmm. on in the mantle. So, so stuff entering in place A, but ending up in place, you know, a totally different place. Yeah. And then later stuff enters here, but ends up here or there, <laughs> else you cannot explain it. But that yeah. was at a time when just the, the images of the mantle were not complete. And so I think we have to take a step back now and say, look, we yeah. new data, um, let's try it again. Thank you for that aside. Very interesting. Let's not go too crazy in that direction. Let's let's go back to a few more. This is this. I'm just loving this, Karen. Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah. So so you know then that then so that that's what what we did then just to all of this reasoning proceeds as saying wherever we see a slab in the mantle. So for at, you know at okay the other the other thing that that we um we do try as a as a as a guess is that anything that is deeper in the mantle should have subducted earlier okay so so that that's reasonable because usually the mantle is the mantle is a system that's it's it's like a fluid that's very well mixed and there's there's no physical reason to assume that it's very different in one place of the earth than another so normally it should be doing more or less the same behavior everywhere. But but that was the thing that, that has been called into question with these, you know, missing slabs. And but mm. but here we say you here we try the, the the hypothesis that something that is deeper subducted earlier, so disappeared from the surface earlier. And we're not saying we're not saying at what rate it's sinking. That is the one free parameter that, that will hopefully come out of that our reasoning. And it, it does come out of a reasoning. It, it comes out as about 10 millimeters per year. So these these walls that you see here are still, you know, sinking by about one centimeter every year. 
but it's not it's that number is not something we assume it's it's something that is the only reasonable number that's the only number that makes the scenario work mm -hmm. so it comes out as a parameter estimate okay so but then then you can see how this this would proceed because at at the time that this yellow slab entered the mantle evidently the trench had moved a bit west and and at the time it's it we get this turquoise it had moved even further west it's somewhere here however there's there's also still always this cascadian trench that's always further west and that that always sitting way out in the west and and sitting there for a long time unperturbed until finally you know, you can see in your mind's eye, you have to see North America coming from the from the right of side of the page and slowly yeah. riding over everything. Yeah. And and finally, it, it even arrives in Cascadia, um, where, where part of the Farallon plate subducts, but another part of the Farallon subducts here. Mm. So it's really a two part story for this plate. And um, it, it 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 can account for quite some some complications, including your discussion of you know is the Chugach uh, oh. is the Chugach paired the Chugach um, subduction complex paired with Rangelia, for example. Mm. Mm. Um, so one other thing is that if if we okay so let's see so. The, the the big you know the big the big picture is that if we go far enough back in time to when North America was still with Pangea, yeah, um, if these things are old enough, then they were out in the ocean west of North America. You can see that there is a gap. It's this shaded gap, and that must have been seafloor, mm -hmm. because you we cannot fill that gap in any other way. And um, and how did the seafloor disappear? Well, the only possibility is that as North America was approaching, so it, it drifted west. There's no question about it. And you can see where it's constructed at 140 million years. We know that because we can reconstruct the Atlantic, not the Pacific. And so the only way that this can close is by this Sea floor subducting into these slabs, because else you cannot get North America close, closer. It cannot move west. Yeah. Um, because yeah. if you subducted it under this margin, there should be slab under the Atlantic here. Mm. Okay. So if that if that shaded blue region had subducted under the North American margin, as is the standard geological interpretation. We should see slab in this area, and a bit later we should see slab here, and a bit later we should slab here. But we don't. There is no slab under the Atlantic, and there's this, but there's this very long-lived thing, this wall with a lot of seafloor in it here, and that means, you know, the way North America managed to get west was by subducting this blue seafloor into this slab. So it's the only logical solution. And then you were asking about Spencer's picture, which was interesting. You were asking, you know, it doesn't look like a wall. Well, well, you're right. It doesn't look like a wall in one special place, which is here. I don't know if you can oh, see. Oh, I'm that, sorry. You know? Let me let me go back. No, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Um, let me. So here's Spencer's, and Spencer was I. I think kind of pointing out these three main things in the lower mantle and kind of giving his version versus your version of of which lower mantle slab went with which terrain story. So how do you want to proceed with this versus your slide? Well, I'm, I'm you know, you just saw the, the very steep slab walls, um, yeah. which, which are under. Can you can you see my cursor again? Let's go back. Yes, we can. Yeah, so so which are under here uh -huh. and under here, but there's one place on these slab walls. It's the it's the it's where it protrudes the furthest east. Mm -hmm. um, that that it has the sloping. That means for furthest east, it's it ends at a deeper level. 
they, this normal slab had been added into it. And, and here it ends a bit shallower and a bit shallower. And so that's where Spencer was cutting through. So he has a cut that goes like this. Mm. And so it shows a sloping slab. But we're saying that doesn't mean there was eastward subduction. Um, that, that doesn't mean that subduction was eastward, but rather what happens is you can see where, where I'm showing North America at 140 million years. What was, what, was, what was it encountering when it got to this red point? Well, there must have been arcs. So over every subduction zone, there are arcs and some arc terrains. And so far, we don't know yet what that was. We, we have to, that has to then fit with the geology. But something must have sat there. And North America comes along and it comes to this red edge and it runs into that arc. And so it overrides the arc. And by the way, this ocean, the blue one is now used up. So there's nothing more to subduct in this place around 150 or 140. So here the subduction, the westward subduction stops and no more slab added. And that's why the slab adds at a deep level. But North America keeps going a little and it comes to this yellow point. And so up to that point, slab had still been added in this place but now the continent runs into the arc where it's sitting here so mm -hmm. i should have drawn barbs here so now this part is being extinguished and any terrain that was sitting in that place gets accreted baked against the margin and so you can see that the first collisions would have happened here and the arc extinction and then up here that would have gradually happened you know tens of millions of years later and the same here it would have happened later because that that extra ocean which we named the mescalera ocean was wider in that place well i'm i'm uh I, i'm so grateful for all of this and i i want to continue for another three hours with you but i think instead since we have more than a thousand with us um Let's, let's improvise, Karin, if you're okay, and we'll go to some of these questions, and then we can come back to a few more of these slides if you like, but um, let, let's involve these guys. Uh, you've got a few more minutes, do you? Yes, yes, I'm, okay. I'm here for you. Okay, thank you. Okay, live viewers, let's go ahead. We'll just stick with this, uh, with this format right now, and uppercase, you know, and, and uh, Karen, I don't know if you can see these questions or not, but I, I, I'm just going to kind of go for it and grab a few, unless you see something. Um, okay, well, North Scani Nerd asks, uh, how does this fit into the Rocky Mountain orogeny story? Do that in three minutes, Karen. <laughs> yes, so let me, let, me see, let me see if I have some slides about this. Oh, okay. Um, the, I just, uh, okay. So how does this fit in the Rocky Mountain story? So, you know, if, if it, working this further, we hadn't gotten there, but I said over every, over every arc, they must have set a terrain. And so thinking about this, what are the constraints? We came up with this, with this, um, so uh, around 170 mi million years ago is when North America seriously starts going away from Pangaea. So the Atlantic, you see some isochrons here. Atlantic is starting to open the central Atlantic. What we also know from geology is by that time, 170 million years, the intermontane superterrain had accreted. So the intermontane is, is, is baked to America and we don't think that is um, negotiable. So that has to go with the continent. Mm -hmm. The controversy is what about Rangelia? And that is the... That's the orange stuff here, and this is the Guerrero, which is its its brother in Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, and so we say, okay, even though the, the mainstream is that this was also baked against North America together with Intermontane, we don't think it was. We think the evidence is not that solid in geology. And uh, by the way, we're not the we're not the only and first ones. This is since 1970, since Eldridge Moores, this has been debated. So we think now the reasonable way is to put the Rangelia over this big seaboard slab wall and central Alaska is going to, you know, is growing here. And then the Rocky Mountain story. So, so then we say, okay, I, I'll just, I'll just show you four slides and just look at the pictures. Um, 
of how these terrains gradually get accreted as I step towards present time. So this is 140 million years. And we can see that North America has just started to hit this place, that the first place that I was talking about. So then the next slide is, is this. Okay, so I'm going back. So you can see how it's starting to um, starting to accrete. And, and we think that is the Nevada Orogenies and the Sierra Nevada. That's, that's this first place being hit. But then that broadens out, and this is shown here by these, by these, and that is um, the Sevier orogeny in the United States and the Rocky Mountains orogeny in Canada. Mm -hmm. It's what that's called. So I don't know if your question is about. It might not have been about the. It might have been about the the Rockies in the U.S. It's not about them, but it's about the Rocky Mountains and Sevier. Uh -huh. And then we go further into time, so 75 million years. Okay, so I'll, I'll go back again and forward again, but you can see how slowly all of these terrains, as the slabs get overridden, all of the terrains get smushed along the margin, with the exception of Cascadia, which survives for a very long time, because it has this offshore subduction until finally, you know, even around the Eocene, Cascadia also mm -hmm. is done. Mm -hmm. But we can see that Cascadia has had a different subduction history than, than all the rest. And what we can also see in this picture is that the Farallon subduction complexes, which is the green thing, so that is the Franciscan subduction complex and the Chugach, as soon as the subduction, the, the westward subduction is finished here, which starts from this moment, subduction has to flip. Because we know North America just kept going, kept going, kept going. And there was seafloor all here. So it's where, where North America starts riding into that other hemisphere, the Farallon hemisphere, and start subducting that Farallon plate. So wow. that starts here. So that is the oldest part of the Franciscan, probably, or or the oldest part of the Chugach, which are with they are they are the same. Well, they're both some some of the green. And because of all this Baja BC translation, it's hard to say. You know, it's it's probably Franciscan, but the Franciscan could also have been significantly further south. In any case. As North America rides in, the green gets more and more because there's more and more Farallon subduction when, when this here is forced now to subduct mm. like this. Mm. And so, so yes, this Tugach um, is plastered or this subduction complex, the Farallon subduction complexes are plastered against Rangelia. If there is still Rangelia left in the Cascades, then we'd say yes. Um, I mean, what you were, what you were musing about um, well, it it, uh, it has to have a subduction, a subduction complex with it from quite an early time, so from you know 130, 120, yeah, in some places, but much later in other places. Well, for some of us, there's so many moving parts and fixed parts. I yes. mean, my God, it, it, it every you have mo. I can just speak for myself. You have moments where you're like, oh, I think I got this, and then and then you. And then you keep thinking, and then you go five steps back, and then you talk to somebody, and then you, you go ahead, and then you go back, and oh, my heavens, you know. So it's, it's going to take us many, many years, and, and you somehow are able to see some of this, maybe with your collaboration with Mitch, or uh, are, can you comment on the last 15 years how your ideas have evolved as far as the timing of all these terrains and everything else? Well, I mean, yes, so, so the, the, the geology is mainly contributed by Mitch. And when we first started talking in, in 2011, you know, we were, we were very far apart. So it took, it took quite a long time to find, or we could see it would be very interesting talking, but it took a, a long time finding a common language and also getting used to this, which is really a data overload in a way in these images, right? Because you have to keep so many observations in, in the place. So yes, yeah. your, your reaction is completely standard and we were we were like that but then uh, but then i think what is our strength strengths now is that because we are quite far our expertise our native expertises are quite far apart but we but we we can join them up now is is that um uh you know we can put them together but but i mean mitch is the one who 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 digs through the geologic literature and and assesses that um mainly against uh you know, but but obviously has a very good understanding of the mantle now. The way yeah. we think, and my understanding. I mean, I've I have learned I have learned uh, a lot of geology. Um, there's <laughs> yeah. nothing as motivating as having to defend your ideas. 
Um, you know, geophys geophysics is very different. It's this is an imaging method, so like every imaging method. The microscopy, um, the telescopy. For us, it's easiest to see the big, the, the large scale things. So, if a slab wall is 10,000 kilometers long, like these, that's. But that's not the scale of, of field geologists, which is which is something that Mitch is, and he's specialized in, in subduction complexes, for example, and and these terrains in Canada. Um, you know, you spend a whole career mapping very small areas, and then it, it's of course it's offensive if someone comes along and says, "Oh, you've missed a suture that runs along all the." Right. You know the whole continental margin. <laughs> um, of course, they haven't. It's not. It's not. It's not that geologists have missed it. There are all these observations, but it's you have no motivation to join them up as much as as. Or it it might seem contrived to make these stories if if you don't have a very a very specific reason you know to look for it. But with these. These models are very predictive. So, so you know, the 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 first almost until the last slides, I talked only about geophysical observations. They make these predictions of this extra ocean, when it closes, how it closes. So they make predictions about where ophiolite should be, subduction complexes, arcs should be on the western side or the eastern side. So then you can go back to the field and look in a very specific manner. You know, if the arc first was in the west and then in the east, uh, and if you don't have that reason to look then it's it's hard well i just you know i the only the only version of you that exists on youtube is that talk in barcelona that you gave more than five years ago and i i just i'm just thinking about that right now with you the guts it takes for some for you to just walk into that room and you're talking to geologists i assume maybe you're not but like you're getting all this pushback in real time and I can't imagine doing that. I'm collaborating with some person in music and I'm going to a music conference. I'm going to talk about all these stuff. I mean, I, I just yes. admire, admire you so much for that. And you're still dealing with some pushback, I guess, is what I'm hearing. Yeah, yes, of course. But, but you know, I mean, there have been people before us and that, that has been incredibly helpful. And those, those have been geologists like Eldridge Moores and Schweikert and... Um, and and uh, Stephen Johnston and um, a lot a, a lot that have been that have pointed out even Bill Dickinson in ways um, that have pointed out um, discrepancies and and what they have said is in the literature and you can use it it has just not become the main the mainstream opinion but but it's clear that this uh, is a question that has been open for a long time and and then you know I've I've. I think I haven't had as hard a time as they because because I, I did come with a significantly new data set and this method is something that, you know, tomography is something, it's used in the oil industry, it's used to decide where to drill, so there's some ground truth into it, it's it's mm -hmm. not so easy to just discard it. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, and I, think, I think there's a great opportunity for geologists to go back to the field and and you know certain things that may it, because of obviously what this is spelled out by these observations is not it's not a very simple scenario um but it's no more complex than what's happening on on the earth today for example in the, the southwest pacific so where this earthquake happened today is is the main example it's an analogous system it it has it has dozens of trenches they they some are, some are major some are minor they stand in in very strange angles but the, what unites these two is that two big oceans are subducting. In this case, it's the Indian Ocean under Sumatra and, and the Pacific Ocean from from the from the from the east. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's that's basically the scenario that we're saying happened here. There's the Farallon Ocean is subducting, but at the same time, there's another ocean, this extra ocean on the leading edge of North America. Mm. So. You know, if, if you knew nothing about uh, about what's going on in the Earth today, you could say, "Oh, that's very that's very contrived and something like complex like that." And then, if you're if you only have the surface observation as a geologist, if you want to hypothesize something like that, and Eldridge Moore did that in 1970, which is which is amazing. You can imagine it's a hard time, and people can easily say, "Oh, that's too complicated." But but then you see it in the mantle. You saw these slab walls. It's it's very contrived to explain them away. And so I think, I, I, I think, I think people will come around. <laughs> I think, I, I hope so. Okay, let's, I, I've been hogging the time as usual. I've only asked one uh, live uh, question. We'll try to do a few more. 
Um, Jeff, do the slabs eventually melt and come back up as basalt in the Atlantic spreading ridge? Yeah, it's a, it's a super question. Um, we, we, don't, we don't exactly know. So we can follow the slabs down to the core mantle boundary. So the core is made of iron and is much denser, so they would never enter into the core. Uh, we still see a lot of slabs. The reason we see these slabs is that they're still cold. So they, they, they sucked up the coldness of the universe while there were plates. And, and that's why they're visible. And so because they bunch up to very thick, they now lose their ambient, they, they lose their, their coldness very slowly in the mantle. And we can see these big slab graveyards on the core, core mantle boundary. And mm. we don't know, we, we, see, we see slabs that, that seem to be um, Paleozoic in age, just judging by, they are under Eastern Asia where in the, the, the orogenies were in the Paleozoic. Wow. But we don't see slabs that are obviously a billion years old or so. Um, so it, it's likely that some of it melts because, because the big upwellings, the plumes, like Hawaii, the geochemists say they have a signature of subducted, um, of eclogite, which is subducted um, bizarre, the crust. So it's, it's likely that some of it comes up again, but whether it's a lot or not, we don't know. Thank you. Perfect answer, of course. Let's do a few more. Uh, Greg, please answer this question that's really been bothering me. What causes earthquakes at deeper than 700 kilometers? Old slabs banging together? Yeah, there are no earthquakes deeper than about 700. So we don't know what causes the earthquakes that are deeper than about 300 or so 3 to 700 we don't know it can't be the same mechanism as that, as, as shallow earthquakes um, but they don't go deeper than about 700 maybe 720 thank you we'll just yeah, and which is by the way which yeah. is, which is which is um which is the transition from the upper mantle into the lower mantle so when when the slab transitions into the lower mantle it literally every every mineral gets transformed it not none none not a single crystal is the same anymore so it, it becomes something very different um so that's pro presumably the reason why there are no earthquakes below 700. very cool uh sharon in wenatchee washington asks are there convection currents in the mantle and could or would they move the slabs yes the slabs are the convection currents so the, the slabs are part of the convection currents. It's an excellent question. So in a, in a default planet and probably Venus and Mars and Mercury are like that, it doesn't work like this. Earth is something very strange. So in a default planet, it would really be like you have a, you have a, um, you have a, a rigid lid, the lithosphere, and you have convection currents underneath and, uh, and no plates, no, no, no gaseous in the surface. Um, in the Earth, the plates are part, so the lid is part of the convection current. So for a while, it's the lid while it's seafloor, but then at some point it has to be become part of the convection current. So, so, so it is part of the current. Thank you. Yeah, we'll just keep going with rapid fire stuff. We want to get as many people involved. Let, let's say 10, if you got 10 more minutes, Karen, that's what we're aiming for here. Sure, sure. Uh, I'm scrolling yeah, back. Yeah, such an engaged audience. It's, it's just so amazing. <laughs> it's, it is. It, it, it's it's fantastic. It fantastic really is. What you do and, and, and you. your viewers. Thank you. Uh, Wallace, what evidence would contradict westward subduction under insular? What evidence would contradict uh, westward subduction under the insular well, super tree? Yeah. So I mean, I mean, what what the prediction is from this westward subduction is that you know I actually don't know if your if if everything is river, if everything is mirror image when I think mine is mirror image I anyway this tell. is westward Maybe. subduction Maybe yeah, it looks like eastward it, I don't know yeah yeah it does yeah okay so that, like eastward. this yeah there you go there you go okay yeah yes so I mean the prediction is that while this is going on an arc is built here right um, so. It's built on on um, on Rangelia, and um, and and when that 
so 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 we should we should see this this arc on Rangelia here. And, and we should not see it on, on the other side. We should not see it um, on, on the Kraton. Um, and, but then people may, so that, that is one thing. So it makes predictions about wh what side of the suture, of a suture, the arc is. Um, and the other thing is it makes, a, it makes a prediction about a suture. So there's an ocean that disappeared and it disappeared at, diff, you know, at certain times in certain places and, and so you should find the remainders of, of, of that missing ocean, the, the Mescalera Angayucham ocean. And that's what we've been arguing mainly in this 2017 paper is a very detailed argument of there are about a dozen basins, the so-called collapse basins along all of the North American margin between the intermontane superterrain and the insular, so Rangelia Peninsula, Alexander. In, in that predicted place. And so, so then we argue that yes, and everything else we know about them also fits, meaning about half of them have mantle rocks. It basically, you can't have mantle rocks in, in, a, in unless you had subduction. So that is a very strong indication. Hmm. Um, and the timing of it fits and, and the arc where it's set relative to that fits. And, um, and so that, they, they, yeah. That's one of the cool things for me, that you, you can use that sinking rate, you can get this stuff back to the surface and it all kind of works timing-wise with, with many of the known things that we have. I mean, it just blows me away. Okay, three more, and I promise we're done. I'm down to live here. Uh, can tomography see stifled hotspots under the craton? I, I guess hotspots that are trying to... Yes. Um... I mean, so that that you know that that is basically um, where a hot spot joins the asthenosphere. The asthenosphere is that weak and hot layer that's right under the lithosphere. And so, yes, I mean we we would be able to see that. I'm I, I'm trying to think if anybody has proposed a stifled or stalling hot spot. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess I sort of have in in saying that along the East African Rift. Um, as we're going, so the, the, there's been a big hotspot in Afar, um, which is which is where Africa becomes uh, Arabia. But but Kenya is is a is a controversial place. Is that already hotspot volcanism, or will it be hotspot volcanism? And and so we have recently published as completely unrelated, saying um, that that's probably a coming hotspot. Oh yes. Good. Oh, we got Patrick, age eight. Patrick is a longtime viewer of this uh, series here. So uh, eight-year-old Patrick says, if westward and eastward subduction are happening simultaneously, then does it change? Or how does the oceanic plate change in the middle where it is being compressed? Good question, Patrick. Yeah, that's a great, that's a, that's a great question. So, so look, um, can, can I, what do I have here? Um, so, uh, just go back to that, uh, to this, to this picture. Mm -hmm. Can you, can you see this? Yes, we can. So where this, where this happened for, good. So where this happened for a long time is, is this area, so which is again the Pacific Northwest. So because we said this is a very is a place where slab subducted for a very long time in always the same location, and this is the same. Um, so this Cascadia uh, slab, uh, Cascadia slab was building in the same location for a very long time until North America came along and disturbed it. And so there's a there's a little plate implied by this. So there must have been a little plate in here. And there must have been its boundary here. That's the edges of the slab. And the other boundary, well, something like, like this or, or maybe like this. Mm -hmm. But anyway, for a long time, while these subduction zones were as drawn, there was this plate. Small, we call it the Orcas microplate. So we had to name it. And you can also see that there would have been two terrains sitting on it. One is the terrains made by this Farallon subduction. And one is the terrains made by this, this other subduction which we say is what now makes up central Alaska. So all the terrains that are now central Alaska were sitting here, 
we have relatively little actually to show for this, but they are probably undercreted under southern Alaska. So they are, they are a story lower now and will come up again when the next accretion happens, um, probably. But so the plate wasn't compressed um, because the trenches were just sitting there uh, in the same place. But then when North America finally comes along, it gets squished. And, um, and so actually we think, I mean, that connects to, to Spencer's talk last, um, when, when they published their paper, we thought about, hmm, so, so what actually is the Tsarita erection plate in our world then? And we, just, and, and we realized that, that that must be the erection plate, this micro plate that we've mm -hmm. had called Orca's plate. Yes, okay, sure, yeah. that's a cool tie. Uh, one more and we're done. A, uh, I could go on forever, I really could. Uh, Mr. Tony asks, are, are there any cross-section diagrams, 3D rendered videos to visualize this research? Yeah, is there anything online that you have that's kind of public access, Karen, that folks can see some animations or any kind of graphics that, that, that help? Or is it just the papers that they can go to? Um, well, um, 3D rendered, I, maybe, maybe not, um, I mean, I mean, you know, and they, they, everything ends up on the web now, so the <laughs> talks, but I, I realize, yeah. I, I realize it's, it's not for the general public, we can't be expected to find that. I can certainly send you something, Nick, if you want to put it online. Sure. It yeah. would be something like, it would be something like this, um, where um now we where we step through these, oh, through these times yeah, and as, let's, as north so. let's finish with this this is great yeah so so this this shows north america where it used to be so that's that's here and with it's still more or less with with africa which is this and this is where it, where it has to end up and um from this timing of well when it first hits the slab, well, I'll, I'll show this. So I, there's, a, there's an implied, the slab starts growing in this animation. And so implied in that is a rate at which um, lithosphere gets abducted. And that, that's this number that I said gets estimated from, it's the only number that makes the, makes the scenario work. So it's about 10 millimeters per year. So let's, let's look at what that gives. So North America is still far away. And, and we can see now these slab walls are starting to grow. Okay, so at some point, maybe around 180, which interestingly is about the time, and here the Farallon plate is born. So these are the isochrons that are still on the Pacific plate, and because of this, we know that there was this other plate here. There was a Farallon plate, and it must have subducted, and it has to subduct in the nearest trench. So this is the nearest trench is this. That's this Cascadia mm -hmm. slab. Mm -hmm. So that must be the Farallon plate from here to here. Um, and, and we can see at around the same time that the Farallon plate starts growing, these also start growing. And North America is able to move westward because it subducts that intervening seafloor into this place. And now, well, it, it hovers around a bit, but now it keeps going west. And you can see we adjusted the rate such that at the moment it hits this spot the slab must stop growing there, else else it makes no sense. I mean, right. that, that has to be the sinking. Um, so you can see the slab now stops and North America rides over and you can imagine how little by little all of these, all of these terrains that are sitting there, so Rangelia and Alaska, they get accreted against the margin and the slab starts taking a slant and it looks starts looking eastward dipping. Now it looks like eastward subduction because it is eastward subduction, so now <laughs> Yeah. This domain here, which is not not proper Farallon plate, or a sort of Farallon plate, now has to subduct, and now we get a, a normal, you know, an eastward dipping subduction. You can see how that slab now has takes this. It it wanders with the continent, right? It it that rate works. That one sinking rate rate works for all. Here, something strange happens, which which fits well in your Eocene series. The subduction seems to stop here, which in the geologic literature I cannot really. Uh, there, there's some there's something missing in the story here. Oh, um, interesting. So there should be, yeah. 
Um, in the South, there's no plate under Oklahoma or Texas anywhere. But in the in Cascadia, it keeps going. But Cascadia can also see is being being disturbed now. It's uh, it's getting dragged, and you know, and and we end up we end up where we are now. Wow. Hey. So I, I'll, I'll be happy to send you that. Oh, example. that would be good. Would you be okay if I shared that on my website then? Yes. Yes. And so, wow. so just the final thing is, so that's the interpreted thing. So where the trenches are pointing and you can see we have a lot of westward pointing trenches and then we have a lot of eastward pointing trenches. And so as North America rides into this, the westward ones get, they die. But as it keeps going, there must be new ones to take over because it yeah. keeps going. So lithosphere must subduct. And we have a lot of places where these Farallon subduction complexes can grow. So the Franciscan and the, and the Chugach. And, and then later they get translated along the margin. So it's a real mess to know what, you know, where exactly. Yeah. But yeah. it's. Wow. Oh, hey, it's what? Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's 730 there, I think. So, I mean, on a Saturday, no less. So all I can say is thank you. I don't want to say any more than that or I'm going to start uh, uh, becoming uh, uh, ridiculous here. So you were great as, and I, I really appreciate your time. I know these guys do as well. And I'm going to do this again next winter with more talking about exotic terrains. And if you're up for it, maybe we'll have you back then. Sure, it would be a pleasure. It, it has been a real pleasure because it's, um, it's, a, it's an amazing service that you do to science. And it's so heartening to see so many, so many engaged viewers that are, that are geologists or not geologists. It's, yeah. it's, um, it's a real privilege being, being able to talk well, thank in front you, of this audience. Thank you really very is, much. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, until next time, thank you so much and have a good night there in France. Karen Siglock, Dr. Karen Siglock. Hope you enjoyed that. Sorry we didn't get all your questions. Um, let me let me get my senses here for a second. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed that. I will take uh, some of what Karen has shared with me and put it on the website, and I'll I'll, I'll figure out how to do that efficiently for everybody. Um, yeah. I could see that she didn't have full screen on. We practiced that a little bit yesterday. And yes, her cursor was, was off uh, for us, but was, of course, perfect for her. So it's the same kind of full screen thing. I just didn't want to interrupt her. I, you know, you can imagine if you're on that end, there's, this is kind of a new experience. I mean, even though she's a pro, uh, there's, there's, there's things. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't want to jump in and keep hammering that full screen thing. So uh, I'll keep practicing. Uh, with that, make sure we don't have it a lot again. But besides the cursor that was offset and everything else, I hope that you could follow that. And um, boy, what a thrill. What a thrill. Boy, I, I, I do want to involve you a little bit more before we sign off. As usual, um, I, I, don't, I don't know how to – yeah, there's animations that she has done and uh, maybe will continue to do. Uh, I, I did enjoy visiting with her a little bit yesterday, just in general. Um, she's got some new tomography beneath South America and comparing the North American tomography with the now South American tomography. Apparently, she's working a little bit in the Caribbean now. I mean, she's truly, what's her field area? The world. The world. All right, let me scroll back, see if we can, uh, we can do a, a few more things before we sign off. I always, you know, at this point, I, I don't even know if it's worth it because it's all questions for our guest and I don't have the, 
background. Maybe I can just see a few of your questions and just kind of spitball off of them. I didn't realize the Chugach was such a big deal. The Chugach. I mean, I know Daryl's story is, is interesting, um, but you noticed in the few, you know, that was another thing. She's got an hour talk that she normally gives, and, she, uh, you know, uh, how can she kind of just grab a few slides and have it make any sense? So I thought she did very well, but that's not an easy thing to do and, and deal with us that way. Oh, I've, I've scrolled back too far. I can't even see some of that. I didn't know that. Um, yeah, I'll try to put some links in. I, I don't know exactly. I'll, I'll try to figure that out. Oh, Patrick H. Hey, he's insatiable. He's got another question. Patrick, it's just me now. Do all sinking slabs behave the same way? Are there any to discovered that don't make the ribbon candy? Okay, well, I didn't want to get. I didn't want to hit it too hard with Karin, but I keep hearing from fellow geologists, especially since I kind of dove deeply into Karin and Mitch's world, where I basically have said, you know, boy, what do you think about that westward subduction thing and that fixed insular? And generally the reaction among geologists that I know are like, yeah, it seems kind of wild and I don't know about that sinking rate. And, there's all, just all these kind of fundamental like skepticism about about her work, but I, I I don't understand why. I don't. I still don't think I understand why. And um, so it, it does feel like she's she's um, digging. Uh, yeah, I, I, we don't need to go there. Uh, so Patrick, you want to know? Do all sinking slabs behave the same? I think so. And I think Karn is basically saying. It's a simple model that these plates are all sinking at the same rate through the mantle, and they fold into this ribbon candy and they're big, thick slabs. And uh, why can't we stay simple like that until it's proven that it's not that simple? But why are we getting complicated with these other models if, if, uh, if we haven't disproved a very simple sinking rate for all these slabs? especially since if you bring them back to the surface, they work out roughly with the timing of what we know at the surface. I'm down to live. Uh, Bob, Bobby says, can I just do an overview again? Oh, that's how we'll finish. Thank you. I'll, I'll try it real quick. So circling back to what I was trying to visualize, and some of it was confirmed and some of it just not touched on, with our visit with our guest. I wanted to jump in with Karen and say, so, so what is the story then currently? And I didn't do this because again, I, I wanted to kind of let things kind of flow. So I think my overview, Bobby, is this. I'm going to be thinking a lot in the coming days and weeks and months and maybe years, I don't know, about insular superterrain being fixed. And as I hike through the North Cascades, am I hiking around in rocks that were made out here in the middle of the Pacific? That's Karn and Mitch's view with westward subduction. And we close this ocean, we close this gap by this thing being stationary and North America getting closer and closer to this fixed insular superterrain. And we're ignoring Baja BC until next winter, but remember, this is the thing that uh, was hit further south than Washington, for sure, and maybe as far south as Mexico. So we're looking at the thing that's the centerpiece of Baja BC, so we will be coming back to these discussions, next winter especially. But I don't have the timing, Patrick and Bobby and others, I don't have the timing in my brain because I think there's conflict and there's pushback and there's back and forth about when does everybody agree we have eastward? I think I know the general answer for that. When do we have for sure westward, if we're focused here? 
how much of our history has both, I'm not there yet. And I think in Basil Tikoff's new paper, he has a proposal. And I think possibly, if I read a little bit more carefully in the Karn and Mitch paper from 2017 that we all have at the website, maybe the answers are there. Probably the answers are there. I just, you know, I have to read and reread and reread and reread until I can kind of get there. A toast to you. Here's to our guest, Corin Siglock, from the south of France. Thank you. Here's to all of our guests who have come before in this series. I certainly don't mean to diminish you. I wasn't really fawning over half of you. Don't take it personally. You've all been excellent. (laughs) This one just felt a little different. So here's to all the previous guests who have volunteered their time and their expertise with us. Mm. Here's to you for your continued interest in geology, your continued continued interest in just uh, learning new things. And of course, here's to your health and the health of your family and your friends and your community. In these weird times, we continue to live in. The next time I see you will be this coming Wednesday, January 19th, January, Wednesday, January 19th at 2 p.m. And Jeff Tepper from University of Puget Sound will make his triumphant return. And we will be making our triumphant return to the Pacific Northwest. We leave the mantle. We leave tomography, and we go back to looking carefully at magmas, at plutons within uh, Washington and into Baja BC, uh, into British Columbia as well, (laughs) not Baja BC. And I'm sticking to the plan for the rest of the month. We continue to look at plutons that are in North Cascades or near North Cascades or maybe at least in the Pacific Northwest, and then... Our our last few letters will be uh, transitioning to studying metamorphic core complexes and learning what we can in Washington and beyond. That's the grand scheme uh, for the rest of the alphabet. Thank you so much for joining us today. I can't hold it. I got to bite into this thing. Thank you, Susan, for sending these ribbon candy. I got I got four of them, so I'm I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna see if I can. uh, do this before we quit. Thank you. I love you. And goodbye from Ellensburg, Washington, USA. Delicious. Goodbye.